Well, uh, just just uh, a note on uh, the romantic period. The image here is, I don't know how clear it is, is of a graveyard. The graveyard behind the Bronte household, the, where the parsonage where the Bronte family lived uh, and died, uh, much of them, most of them. Uh, and this is a graveyard and you could see the flat gravestones here. These gravestones are flat. They're just laid there like that. And, and some of them are upright. See, some of them are upright. And these upright ones are more recent and the flat ones are older. The flat stones here in this particular grave, for example, created a very unhealthy living condition for the whole landscape. You have this house behind in the background, which is a Bronte parsonage. And, and the, the whole, the wells were uh, vitiated by the oozings from these graves. People, people, knowledge of science was really low. And the flat gravestone means the bodies wouldn't decompose properly. Such a lot of problems. People lived in ignorance in these good old days. I just want to say, the Bronte family, the, 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 life was very, very tragic. You know, the death was a big reality in those days. Not only in Europe. I am using European images because our most of us have, we have specialized in English literature. But it was exactly the same in our country too. The whole village is being wiped out, as I mentioned. Jane Austen's tragic story. Well, though she... Uh, lived for quite a long time, ailments in the background where she in Northanger Abbey, for example, talking about the Bath city. We don't see her brother dying of consumption at the same time in the city trying to cure himself. There was no remedy for any of these major diseases at that time. Keats was dying as he wrote all those poems which, he, which we read with raptures. The many de deaths depicted in Dickens' novels. So in those days or in the past, life was simple but life was also very very tragic because we had very little control over human life oh so we imagine that uh, in in the past again i am just concluding that it was very it was a haven so and we talk about returning to nature constantly we talk about returning to nature uh, and we have this walden image of thoreau living close to nature but i just this is a lighter part i want to share with you how uh, you know, we often think that in the wilderness, there is a story recently uh, a, a Malayali uh, philosopher was saying that he at one time thought of doing, uh, you know, becoming a hermit and see, he went to the forest and as he was about to enter, he was hungry and he was tired and the people in the village asked him, what will you eat in the forest? He said, I'll eat the berries and fruits in the forest, the roots in the forest. And where will you live? They asked him. And he said, I live in the caves in the woods and then these people told him see there is no food in the woods there is no fruit there for you it's your imagination that the, that the, the forest has fruits for you it has fruits only for the animals there the food that we eat have been created by us over generations over uh, through selective breeding and through you know uh, cross breeding and all that we have created all the stuff that we eat today are human creation and they are not there out in the wilderness. Yeah, well, that, that's the story. I just want to, 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 to you to run through this. The myth that forest has a lot of food for us. Uh, it is, forest does have food, but this would be a natural kind of apple that you will find in the forest. While this is the apple that we think is apple and which people eat. Uh, through selective breeding, we have done that. And here... Maize is a total human creation. This is the plant, the theosinth plant is the parent thing, for, which, which is not even edible. Through, you know, generations of selective cultivation, we have created the maize plant. It, it, it goes with all the food of, uh, life that we have. You know, you, you see the small stuff here. These are all the ancestors of the food that we have, the egg plants, which is a very... A staple thing for many of us. These are the things that you would or probably find in the woods. You won't find these. So the clarity we should have. The forest is not a place where you will get your food like this. Forest has food for us, but that's another topic. That that how you find it. I am talking about nature. I am talking about all these things in the light of modern life. We have traveled a lot from the state when we were living inside the woods as hunter-gatherers. We have become very specialized in our food habits. We have become addicted to so many modern things that there is no question of returning to 
nature in a in a very romantic manner and well i'll skip this i think and and then we have another interesting metaphor that we have is we talk about eating like a king we imagine the kings of the past had wonderful food but that is not the truth in 1600s for example early uh, 17th century maybe the queen of england had uh, you know as for dessert maybe a, a fruit like this you, you the, the image itself has many seeds and little only a little part which is edible but through selective breeding today we have this kind of a watermelon so much of the food that we have and today even the ordinary man in the street eats better than the kings ate in those days since the living conditions are very different now now from the good old days when we think when we often believe that people led a much quality life to the present stage and i would certainly say that we live in the best of times in in in, in uh, you know uh, in a way in a way it, it's all relative you need to look at things from uh, different perspectives if you are a person who would have very basic needs well you could survive in any time but modern man is not like that if you go to a supermarket you find uh, for example the, the huge supermarkets that we have in the major metropolitan cities uh, more than 80% of the stuff in see inside the supermarkets are not needed for us we have learned that during this lockdown we don't need any of those things for survival but again if you i am talking about the human being you and i who are used to the stuff that we have we buy from the department stores to us this is the best of time seen as early as nine as near as 1900 we had only 1.6 billion people living on this planet and today within you know 120 years from then it is 7.8 billion people living in this earth it's a totally different scene that we are in compared to the compared to a century ago medical science has improved so vastly agro technology has improved vastly more than that food supply supply chains you know the food that we buy from our supermarkets have come from so many different countries today and your knowledge your uh, your knowledge about how to survive in a different way using scientific knowledge has also brought us to a stage when we are living in the best of times in that limited manner but then we have our little ways don't we even to even to be miserable in the best of time well that th at this point when we are nearing the uh, conclusion um we 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 are talking primarily about the binary between human and and um, natural forms and the way we treat nature has been in two ways either we talk about conquering nature with our huge machines or we talk about you know in in romantic term, terms in beauty of nature etc so in the as, as it has happened in the feminist and subaltern discourses when we say that the woman is wonderful and she is the you know source of all goodness etc that's also a way of uh, sub subjugating and controlling her so the brutal subjugation itself and this subtle way of such control both are equally bad and that is what we have been doing to nature or natural objects all these days and i'd like to draw your attention to these lines written by susan sontag in as early as 1966 when the consumerist culture was just becoming rampant ours is a culture she is talking mostly about us based culture at that time but it's very applicable to a country like india today ours is a culture based on excess on overproduction the result is a steady loss of sharpness in our in our sensory experience all the conditions of modern life its material plenitude its sheer cloud, crowdedness can join to dull our sensory faculties well uh you know coming to lockdown in the paper newspapers there is this lockdown rhetoric where we talk about nature reclaiming the original air is returning and etc and we have images of deer and elephant and tea fowl and monkeys and rhinos birds coming back into the streets it's it it all looks very lovely uh well what has the global lockdown done recently which has given us clearer air we talk about delhi becoming in the pollution level in many cities including delhi coming down rapidly drastically unbelievably and we have even the ganges river becoming clear so that fish can be seen etc we have very reports on that and we also talk about the wildlife spreading its limbs in centuries that's true 
uh, the, the, all, all the parks that we have near the woods where people have been tramping over and destroying, now they have a breathing space after centuries in fact. But what, what we haven't really achieved much because whatever we have gained now, the cleaner air will go, go bad again. It's guaranteed. As soon as lockdown phases out, when we find a vaccine or in a year, in a year and a half, life will return, I'm very sure, on this. The air will go back. That's because we have our little ways. The cleaner water will certainly go back. The wildlife will be pushed back. All the beautiful wildlife we see roaming, roaming around. We grudgingly allow them to do that now. They will all be pushed back. Many will be killed perhaps and many will cause harm to us as well. They will have confrontation once again. But the real impact, according to me, is what we have actually learned or what we should actually learn is this, this seeing nature. I am using here nature, non-human life forms everywhere. Nature is not out far there. It is everywhere in two ways. As a part of nature, human beings are essentially part of nature. So, it, nature is everywhere around us in that way. In another way, what we generally term, term nature, like the, the flora, the fauna, etc. You don't have to go far to see that. Today, in the morning, without, the, without vehicles running around, even in the daytime, you hear the, the sounds of, the, of nature more. You hear the sounds of the birds. We, this is something we have learned because the forced confinement, we have learned to hear and see the wilderness in our own urban spaces, not exotic species, but what have been there all the time, little sparrows perhaps, and all those little things. Now we have learned to see them. We have learned to, another very important thing is I told about Sontag's quotation about a life that is surplus. We have now learned to live with our 75% stuff that we thought were essential. We, we, are li we, are, we are happily living with a very bare minimum and we are okay with that. And it is a huge uh, influx of consumer products that you know has a chain reaction of uh, compromising life on earth altogether. And we need to, uh, there is this urgent need to respectfully live uh, in harmony. Not with nature. Again, living with nature, we repeatedly say that we don't actually do it. That is why I want you to think uh, uh, differently of the word nature. Not because I have anything uh, uh, against it. It's because this rhetoric of returning to nature, nature being benign, living one with nature, etc. Where it has become so perfunctory that we no longer respect what we are saying. It's time we developed a new discourse to talk about that. Well. So living uh, in an organic unity with ourselves and urban urbaniture or urban nature is a concept that is increasingly uh, gaining relevance these days and it's, it's from a book uh, that uh, I came across, you might have seen it, Ashton Nichols uh, written this book on beyond romantic eco-criticism, Ashton Nichols, it's called um, Towards Urban Natural Roastings, that's where I picked this term, seeing don't going out far to look at nature, recognizing that nature is around us. And the and, and most of the animals that we now see think of as wild are not very wild. The monkeys that we see all over India, they're not wild. They depend on us and our activities for their, their survival as well. So we need to respect respectfully live with them and not romantically uh, involve in, 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 in natural things. It, it's very it's high time we saw all these things as very, uh, from a very scientific point of view and the impact has to be assessed. Um, I would say that the lockdown is a period that we have been going through, which might go on, has been a time when nature returned. But I wouldn't I, I agree, that, agree to that. But I certainly, I, I would say that it has been a beneficial and rejuvenation for, for natural things, just as a human being would go do a detoxing uh, and take a go on a diet or something like that. That kind of a benefit certainly biosphere is having and that is a unique thing certainly. Even though the economic impact it's going to have is huge, from thinking of the natural objects as a very, uh, uh, what shall we say, a very vital thing for survival in, 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 in long term basis, it certainly is a rejuvenation time. And even when we have world leaders who sound so inane and callous, we can certainly hope that humanity will learn 
and draw lessons from what we have seen all these days. Certainly, it will be a big chapter in human history, what we learn during these days. Uh, maybe extend human survival. That's a bit cynical comment on my part because many people believe, including Lovelock, that human being so and, and the planet in which we are living as such will, will survive. But human survival is a big question. The way we are treating the planet uh, so shabbily like a child. And the lessons will certainly remain. And one a couple of things that I, that I would like to assert is that we are not conservers or protectors of nature. So we need to remove that from our uh, holdings and boards that we have. Protect nature. Because you cannot protect nature because you, you're, you, you can protect yourself. And it's you, human survival that is at jeopardy, not nature that is at jeopardy. Uh, as nature in the way we imagine it. And wilderness is important not because they give us anything direct. So you, you, you need to conserve large patches of land allowed to be wild, not because they are going to give you anything, not because they will, uh, you can go and see the animals there, not because you will get some food from there or the trees from there. They need to be left wild so they will serve their purpose. You know, the wilderness has a vital purpose to regulate life on earth and that needs to be there. You don't have to interfere. You, you need not do anything towards that. You just let them be. Let us not interfere with that. And you have here a quotation. from <coughs> Noah Harari, uh, Sapiens, a book which most of you will be familiar with, A Brief History of Humankind. He is rather skeptical about humanity. He calls human beings are capable of running only banana republics. And I'll read the quotation with which I am intending to conclude my talk. The cognitive revolution that turned Homo sapiens from an insignificant ape into the master of the world did not require any noticeable change in physiology or even in the size and size and external shape of the sapiens brain, it apparently involved no more than a few small changes to internal brain structure. Perhaps another small change would be enough to ignite a second cognitive revolution. Sapiens talks about different stages in human evolution, and he talks about a cognitive evolution when human beings' brain uh, began, you know to work in a totally different manner, in a more uh, a capable of advanced thinking. And he hopes for a second cognitive revolution, create a completely new type of consciousness and transform Homo sapiens into something altogether different. So, well, it, I, I, I would like to read these lines as being prophetic because of this huge experience that we are going through. Mm, uh, let us hope that would ignite a second cognitive revolution and that will create a totally new type of consciousness and which will transform us and the world in which we live into a totally different manner.